All right, Hami, welcome to the podcast. Um, yeah, I'm excited to have you. Uh, we have some exciting stuff to talk about today. We've got a lot of new content ruminating in our brains about enlightenment and about traps of the spiritual path. So uh, if you want to go ahead and explain a little bit about just the, the – I'm going to take a little – bit of a different approach on this podcast if you just want to spit out an idea of what you've been reading um we can just go off that and see where it leads us okay okay yeah i've really liked this new idea that i got from this book called awareness by anthony DeMello. and what the idea is is once you renounce something, you attach yourself to it. So a lot of the times in spirituality, and especially if you look at Buddhism, I think it's the most pronounced and like explicit example is renunciation is like praised, you know, that's how you get to enlightenment, you become a monk, you let go of alcohol, liquor, um, sex, pleasure, you let go of everything, and then you become enlightened. And his argument is, if you're letting go, like if you're forcing yourself to renounce something, then you're clinging to it because you're making it, you're making it so desirable in your head that you can't have it, that it's an obstacle on the path. Whereas if you truly understood something, then you wouldn't even need to renounce it. There just wouldn't be a desire for it. Because if you truly understood how things work, then there wouldn't be any attachment to him. It's like what, what you resist persists. Or yeah. like, I, I know I heard this somewhere. I think it was, uh, what, what's that guy's name? There, there's this guy that wrote a book. Called, shoot. I'm blanking. I'll, I'll try to remember it, but basically like, one of the top spiritual gurus in the last couple hundred years, he was talking about how, uh, so the Hindu path, ha- or I think it might be Buddhist too, is they have these two ideas called yamas and niyamas. It's like the do's and the don'ts, right? So it's the same idea. And so like the Buddhist path says, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this. And like, that's how you be spiritual. He said, no, fuck that. He's like, he, <laughs> he's like, I think it was a very similar idea. It's that if you walk the path, you're going to end up following those yamas and niyamas. If you force yourself to do something and like do this good thing and to not do this bad thing, it's going to create the resistance. But if you truly and like intentionally full heartedly go down the path after a while, you'll just end, you won't even want those things anymore. So like the things that you demonize, if you do it correctly, you won't even want them. If you like, walk the path full heartedly so i think that's kind of what you were getting at too is like if you desire them it it makes you if you resist it it makes you desire them even more but if you like instead go about it like what's the how do you go about it without desiring them is what i'm trying to get at yeah yeah i think understand and i think this is where like rationalizing can potentially be helpful because obviously there's certain like things that they prescribed that we should just follow as like ethical people like don't kill people don't steal things don't do these things um those things i think are a little bit more easier to understand hopefully (laughs) because a person is going to be able to recognize like if I'm killing people, then there's going to be a bunch of distrust. There's going to be, even if you don't care about other people, like it does, they don't matter who cares. Even if they are no importance to you, they're going to be mad that you're killing them. So they're going to attack you. They're going to harm you. So even if you're just trying to live out of self-preservation, it's still smart to be like, well, I shouldn't steal from these people. I shouldn't kill these people because that's putting me a danger. That's putting me under stress. That's putting pain on me. I mean, I'd um, like to think there's something deeper than rationality here that like urges you not to kill someone, you know, it's like, there's gotta yeah. be something that's like, 
even if I had no rationalization as to why I shouldn't, there's like something deeper that it's like, this is not like, I, this is not something I should do. Like, this is like, I mean, maybe, maybe there's not, maybe like back in like tribal days when we were in like clans, hunter and gatherers, it's like, was there any of that moral drive? It's like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would like to think so too, but like taking a look at history kind of like <laughs> doesn't tell us that because it's like if you look like at the rationalization of like extreme examples like Nazi Germany or even like brutal tribes like the Aztecs like um well it's not saying that like they didn't I- I'm thinking like like war is a rationalization for killing people but like you got to think that the people that are actually on the front lines they got to feel pretty freaking bad when they actually kill someone even if they keep on doing it because they're getting uh like they're the generals are telling them to it's still like deep down even if they continue doing it deep down there's got to be like some like remorse or like shame or guilt or there's got to be something that like after you do it you see what I'm saying? Like the distinction there, it's like the fact that people do it doesn't mean that they don't feel bad for doing it, you know? Yeah. Except maybe Hitler. I don't, yeah. know, if he, I don't know if he felt bad. I think he was too high on meth to feel bad. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that is a pretty interesting turn into like, human psychology um and that would be interesting as well i mean it it just what comes to mind is like there's certain tribes i remember reading one time about this this tribe it's called like the maori tribe and they were responsible for a genocide and there was a neighboring village and these people were peaceful like they adopted this new philosophy of like peace so like you know what we're not gonna fight anymore and the maori people were like fucking bet we're gonna destroy you guys it's gonna be easy and they did they were just wiping out this village and like nobody was fighting back and the other tribe had like double the amount of members so they could have fought back so that it that does sort of bring some questions in my mind so like i think it does sort of depend on like what you were brought up with and your like cultural um conditioning because i imagine the maori people wouldn't be like if they killed each other they would be like oh yeah cool this is awesome they'd probably be like no what, what, what are you doing you're destroying our unit you're destroying like our chances of survival um so we almost think it's almost culturally ingrained in us as we grow up so that it seems like it's in it seems like oh, if I had no rationalization, I would still not do it. But maybe we just been like, in doc- not, I don't want to use the word indoctrinated, but like growing up, it's been a part of our culture ever since we were able to learn language. So we just see it as like, this is, I don't know. It's like, this is a tough line to walk because it's like, obviously it's bad. But if you try to like talk about it, it sounds like you're trying to rationalize it. Uh um <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah this no, is a, yeah it's a tight line <laughs> yeah it's not an easy topic no, yeah no. i mean we could take a step back um and start yeah. going into spirituality more yeah so where do we start this from it, it was like i can't remember what started it we were talking about how yeah. desire causes you to resistance to something makes you want it even more yeah yeah and then i was talking about um yeah then i was talking about how rationalization and like understanding things makes you not want to do them so it's like if you truly understood the implications of killing somebody you wouldn't want to do it um and that might be a little bit (laughs) too extreme but even if we look at, and I think it gets harder once you look at like the trickier um, 
desires or urges that a person might have that are a little like culturally taboo, like sex and alcohol and stuff. Because those things, as long as they aren't fueling, like as long as you're not killing people while you're drunk, if you're just a drunk and if you just are a sex addict, then those things aren't inherently hurting anybody. But if you truly understood the implications and if you truly understood the nature of those things, then you wouldn't want those things to begin with. And a lot of people like in Buddhism, those are like monks have to vow to not have sex. They have to vow a bunch of things, but they have to vow to not have sex and to not drink alcohol. At least I know in the Theravadin traditions, like the kind of OG school of Buddhism, I don't know the other ones, but you have to renounce these things. And it's sort of this idea that these things are so pleasurable and these things are so distracting and so powerful that I just, I can't have them. I just get them out of my face. I'm going to be, I'm going to want this instead of enlightenment. And his argument, his saying is that, no, like if you truly understood the nature of these things, you would just drift towards enlightenment. You'd be like, you get bored. You'd be like, oh, this is dumb. I don't need this. And then you go to enlightenment. And then the story he said he gives for that is from an Indian guru. And the Indian guru says, whenever a prostitute comes to me, she talks about nothing but God. She says, I'm tired of this life. I, I just want God. I want God. And then when a priest comes to me, he talks about nothing but sex. And so it's sort of like the prostitute understands the nature of sex. And so she naturally lets it go. She doesn't want it. She wants God. And then the priest who's like trying to like, oh, I don't want sex. I can't have this. I can't do that. He's obsessed with it. It's almost like, like learning from experience. So it's like the prostitute has had enough experience with it that she's like, that the person is like, realizes that it's a hollow pursuit they don't get any form of long-term happiness from it the priest does not have that experience so he's like this is the answer this is what i'm missing like this pursuit of like preaching to the choir is not making me fulfilled i need this other thing that's like super pleasurable and so it's almost yeah. like is it it's almost like necessary in that sense it's like you have to experience it to I mean, that's a bad, that's a bad way to put it too. Cause then you could just <laughs> rationalize so many different things, but like, yeah. it's almost like you realize that doing seeking pleasure leads to a hollow feeling. You don't need to, yeah. and I guess you don't, you don't need to experience every form of pleasure to know that seeking pleasure will not make you fulfilled. So it's like, I don't have, you don't have to like, go take some hard drug to know that it's not going to make you fulfilled because like, yeah. because there's other milder form of pleasure, like, I don't know, alcohol, having a couple drinks or like, like doing, using social media or whatever. This is pleasurable, but like, this doesn't make you fulfilled at all, but it's yeah. like, I, I have this feeling that like, people understand this. So people that are doing these things are like, this doesn't make me pleasurable, but there's no better alternative. In my mind, there's like, there's so many people that are dissatisfied with the, what our culture gives us as like the means to achieve pleasure, to achieve fulfillment. Everyone wants to yeah. be fulfilled and happy. These things don't yeah. make you happy, but there's no yeah. better alternative. Like maybe like enlightenment, but most people don't like understand what, this type of work really is and why it's valuable. So they're like, Oh, that's just some hippie hippie nonsense. Or even like if people do understand it, it's like, Oh, that's going to take me like 20 years to get like, I don't have that patience or there's all these different blocks. It's like, I, I don't want to say it, it's hard to come off as like, I, I think it's more just like, rather than seeing enlightenment as the end all be all, it's like, having this spiritual dimension, having this dimension of like going beyond the gross physical realm. I think that's like kind of where we're leading. And it's like to get happiness, to get fulfillment is to stop chasing these 
external desires and to look for something else that's it's hard because it's hard not to use so many cliches you know it's like just turn inwards like stop seeking external pleasure and it's like yeah what does that even mean you know yeah but yeah i think um and this is what has truly been i think transformational for me because I did notice myself trying to embrace like this renunciate path because like I wanted to be a monk and I visited monasteries and I was thinking, you know, I wasn't doing it from the right place. I was just like, I'm going to renounce everything and I won't have anxiety anymore. I'll be happy. It's going to be great. And I think that I don't know, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really how you perceive everything and the stories that you tell yourself in your head, like your, percep- your perceptions that really filter your life and make you happy, make you enlightened even maybe or make you um whatever because even if you hear like the great spiritual teachers whenever they communicate with people whenever they talk or something they speak in like stories you know like you can tell that's how they see the world like uh like turn inwards or the happiness is within that's that's a story that's a perception that they're trying to give to you so that if you were to truly embody that and truly think that, then your whole world would shift. Your, if, if that was the thought that your mind ran off of, your whole world would shift. Your emotions would be different. Everything would be different. It's, all, it's almost like that's the, the best way that they, they're able to explain their experience because like you can't say this is what I'm experiencing if you're in that deep state of non-duality. It's not like... Yeah this is what it is now go experience it for yourself. It's like, here's a story that kind of describes it as best as I possibly can. This may, this is like, I I like using the analogy of like the point. It's like thoughts are just pointers. They're just labels. So it's like this story will help point you in the right direction, but it's not going to give you anything. It's just like use this framework as a way, as a process for like, met for contemplate how do i want to put this it's like this is the technique that's going like meditation practices it's like this is a technique that's going to help you experience something i can't explain to you what you're going to experience because only you can but this is the technique that's going to point you in the right direction that sort of thing yeah yeah um well, and see, that's uh, – go ahead. Another thought that you were talking about, it's like they speak in stories in like our – how we perceive something is how like it actually ex- – or like it's interesting to note that like everything that we perceive is just a story. So like our entire reality is based around stories and like yeah. the stories we tell ourselves shape our reality. Like that's another slight, that's kind of like getting to the cliche again of like your thoughts shape your reality. But it's like, if you actually like do some reflection, it's like when you change the story and then you'll see firsthand how it changes your experience So like, if you change your story of what's happening to you or anything, self-help 101 right here, that changes like how you experience it. But you can also take that deeper and deeper and deeper until you get to this spiritual dimension of that same idea. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of the ideas that I've, where I've been getting, um, this idea that your perception changes your reality and really affects your reality is from stoicism. Um, I'm reading Marcus Aurelius, meditations right now. Um, 
but there really is some good points. And you can even hear in the way that he talks how that shapes his world and how that shapes, yeah, how his thoughts shapes his world and, and like all his, um, his reaction to the world, his emotional response to the world. And this guy's a, he's legit. He's like top shit, you know? And then that's what I think is so great about meditations is that it's coming from a, it's coming from an authority, you know, it's not the poor person who's saying money can't make you happy. It's like, well, you don't know that you don't have money. It's yeah. like a ruler who has the whole fucking world at his hands, the most powerful empire in existence. He's the emperor of Rome. And he's like saying all these things. He talks about praise and he says, these people are so dumb that they praise me and they care so much about this stuff and they don't realize they're all going to die and they don't realize I'm going to die. And they don't realize that like all this stuff that they think is so important, it's, it's worthless. Like he was talking about how, how like, and he says this a lot, how like Alexander the great and all these fucking legends from history who have the whole world at their fingers. What are they now? They're nothing, you know, we don't, what, what concern yeah. is Alexander the great to us? We don't, worship statues of him every day before breakfast and that really showed that he came from this position of like calmness and tranquility and like even like it just peace and yeah but i think it's interesting and this is what i've thought about with enlightenment is like Enlightenment can only be like, like uh, enlightenment to us can only be like very simple. It can only be, it can only be interpreted into certain structures of like the human experience. So like, for example, enlightenment could only be sensation in our body like sensations of temperature sensations of pressure sensations of this or that or of color and of shapes and of forms like um yeah because enlightenment it seems like it, it would be as simple and operate on the exact same framework that any other emotion or any other experience that a human can have it would have to operate under the same principles because we're a human being, we can only experience like, I mean, some human beings can, I guess, experience light and color and stuff, but um, <laughs> we can only experience like a certain array of feelings like temperature and pressure and all these things. Um, so that's what I thought is pretty interesting about enlightenment as well. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, about how. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I think a common trap is thinking that you're going to experience something super far different from what you're currently experiencing or that it's going to be like a radically different shift in your reality in, in reality. Like I think it goes back to the idea. It, it, it relates to the idea and philosophy of like phenomenology or like, or, uh, Let's see. So I can go at this a couple different ways. Science tries to understand what consciousness is by like looking into the brain, but there's a key distinction that most scientific pursuits miss, right? It's the idea of phenomenology versus like objective, ev like objective data, whatever you want to call it, evidence. It's like yeah. you can, you can, uh, label whatever you want but you can't explain this experience that i'm having right now no matter how detailed you get into the brain you can never explain the actual experience like what the experience of an emotion the experience of the color blue you can't explain that through neurons and it goes yeah. the same thing it's like enlightenment you're having a certain experience that experience whatever you're feeling right now doesn't ex doesn't change when you become enlightened it's just 
like you who you, what enlightenment is right it's understanding who you truly are who you yeah. truly are is going to be true at every instance of your life you're going who you really are is true right now so yeah. it's not like i want to get something other than what i have right now it's like what this is right now this is enlightenment and it, it's more instead of like it's get i think a crucial point is like understanding that the spiritual path isn't about adding stuff. It's not about like, I need this new experience. I need this enlightenment experience. I need this. I need that. It's more letting go of everything that is false. So I believe I'm the body. Let that go. I believe that I'm this, let that like everything that you let go gets you closer to the truth and gets you closer to what everyone calls enlightenment or non-duality or whatever you want to call it, there's a thousand different names for it but like it's more about letting go of the false rather than trying to add more to your experience if that adds to your point yeah um i think i like how you said that like enlightenment what it, if enlightenment is your true self and that's what enlightenment is is you're realizing your true self then you're your true self in every single moment of life and yeah. i think that's really interesting and that's a, that, that's something that sort of i guess snapped me out of this mindset of expecting enlightenment to solve anything is that like even the pursuit of enlightenment or wanting to get enlightenment or wanting to get a good job or not even acknowledging enlightenment, that's all under the realm of enlightenment. That's all under the, under the guise of truth. Like even deny the truth is always going to be there. Even if you deny it, even the denial of truth is a truth. It's something that's happening. It's, it's something that's there. And that's what I think is helping me because it's, it's sort of like, it's okay to want worldly desires. It's okay to want worldly pleasures. It's okay to want a good job. It's okay to want a girlfriend. It's okay to want to have a couple of drinks once in a while. That's all under the, the realm of enlightenment as well. And maybe it will get to a point where you have the girlfriend, you have the drinks, you have the job. And then you're like, this is pointless. I don't really need this. And then you do become, go become a renunciate. But I'm, I mean, I don't know necessarily in certain buddhist traditions but there are certain traditions where even the lay people who have wives who have families who have worldly possessions they are like considered enlightened and it's yeah i i think there's a a a key a key point to add on you said like thinking that enlightenment is going to solve all your problems and it's like yeah that that's the that's where i came at it from for a while it sounds like that's where you came at it from too it's like that's a very common thing to do is like i i want this enlightenment thing it's like we make it into an we objectify it it's like i want this object called enlightenment once i acquire this object then i will be free of suffering right but no it's like it's like an ointment or something Yeah. yeah no i talk so i talked to this guy uh enrique a couple like a week ago so the podcast is going up in a tomorrow actually but by the time they're listening to this it's already live um he had he had a really cool point of, of on a very similar topic which was that he does a lot of like emotional work does different breath work techniques whatever but it, it pertains to this so well and it's that enlightenment or like stopping suffering happens not when we not through anything that we do it happens when we how how was i gonna explain it it happens when or no that's what it was that's what it was so it's like you said i want to get enlightenment to like stop like that's going to solve all my problems and like what you don't realize is that enlightenment is the experience that you're having right now so nothing in your experience will change just your relationship to it will change. So it's more like 
you will have the same experience, but all of the unnecessary suffering that your mind is creating on top of the experience will be let go. So that's when they say you won't suffer. You will still experience painful emotions. You will still experience all the, all the shit that you experience on a daily basis, but there won't be that added layer of like, I'm labeling this as bad. This sucks, which creates an extra level of suffering on top of the baseline. So once you get rid of all of the, all the labels that you put on top of your experience, that's what getting rid of suffering means in my eyes. Maybe it's, that's how I view it. Yeah. I think this is something that I had personal experience and I think this is a good example. Um, I mean, and it feels pretty powerful for me. It's not going to feel powerful for you because it's not some extreme story, but like, the other night, probably like a week or so ago, I was laying in bed and I felt super fucking anxious, like tightness in my throat, tightness in my stomach. Like, like I'm not going to say on the verge of a panic attack, but like the same sensations of a panic. And like clearly in my head, I was like, this is going to pass. And I, I believed it. I was like, this is going to pass. And then I could just lay there and I could lay there for hours with that sensation. And I wouldn't be like, oh, it's, like, oh fuck, like, it's never going to oh, oh. like, no, I was just like, it's going to pass. It's no big deal. Like it's just, it's just some sensations in my body. And I was like proud of myself because I knew like half a year ago or a year before I would have been in bed, like, Oh shit. Oh fuck. Like trying to catch my breath. Um, but that does really highlight how powerful you perceive an experience like really how that makes the experience and that's where i i agree with you completely that understanding an experience and like really honoring it takes away any any pain because it does it does and i know it has to me it seems really like well that's a fucking cop out there's no fucking way you know it's like there's no way a monk is not gonna be if they step on a nail, they're not going to be just as like, they're not going to suffer any less than I would if I stepped on a nail. Yeah. But it really is your relationship to pain that I don't even know how to describe it. It just changes the whole dynamic of it. It's like, it's really not the same experience. Um, It's still painful. And then even like, painful experiences aren't entirely bad and i think sam harris makes a good point on this and it does go along with uh, uh, perception as well um what he talks about is like after like a really rigor or while you're doing a really rigorous exercise right like you're out of breath your your muscles are really tight like imagine if you were just walking in like walking down the aisle at walmart and you started getting those sensations that would be a completely different experience than if you're at the gym, you know? So it really is like the same raw sensations, but it's just our perceptions that make them out to be this immensely pleasurable, immensely motivating, or like incredibly terrifying experience. Yeah. A hundred percent. Context is everything. Yeah. Yeah, man. All right, so I think we can direct the conversation towards another topic that we're interested in. So there's this idea that I th- I think I want to preface with. Um, so there's this idea called relating to structures of consciousness. I'm about to re- release a blog post on it, actually, so it, it will be on my website, becomeconscious.org, to learn about it. But basically, it's the idea that everyone moves through the same 10 to 12 stages of development or more the but most people on don't get past like the fourth or the fifth stage or something like that and so the idea is that as we move through these stages we develop certain shadow elements dysfunctions things that we fixate on or that we repress and so so for example a couple of common models are spiral dynamics. You have, uh, 
I'm blanking on the other ones, but there's different stages of any different, like you, you have different stages of what you value most in life. If, if so, how these were created was that these re- psychologists would go up to thousands of people and say, what do you value most in life? And then they would mm-hmm. take those and then the, they would see common answers and they would create this model about, all right, well, people that are in this stage tend to like they were in this previous, they, they valued this. And then two years later they value something else. And like, Oh, these thousand other people also had the same experience. Well, they, they valued this most and then they value something else. That's kind of how they created them. And so we, they've come up with these super elaborate models about how you're, as you move through stages, as you move through life, if you aren't stunted at one level, you develop more pr- the ability to understand more perspectives, the ability to take like anyone's perspective on the world rather than just your, the perspective of your in group. So it's like, I'm thinking of like any religious fundamentalist. So it's like, no matter what religion you're in, there's fundamentalism, which is basically like my religion is the only religion. If you don't follow my re- religion, then you're damned. So it's like either, Oh, you'll go to hell or for like, Islam there's certain sects of Islam where it's like killing someone outside of my religion isn't bad because my I I can only take the perspective of someone inside my in-group I can't understand I can't understand what it's like to live with someone in in the in the out group and so that's why I like killing someone in the out group is seen as actually something good you'll go and get however many 72 virgins and I don't even know what it is but what I was getting with this is that, so you go through these stages as you go through them, the pro so tell me if this makes sense. So the process that you use to go through one stage to the next, or just to move through these stages is the process of making your subject into an object. So that basically means that, as you go through these stages, think back to like two years back. What, what were you like? So tell me, tell me what you were like two years back. Like what was your perspective two years back? Like how has it changed? Like just tell me a little bit about like what was it like to be you two years ago? Just like from like a perspectives level or like what did you believe or like the high level stuff? Okay. So two years ago. I would have been by a junior in high school. I would have been about 16. Um, Are you referring to like what, like my philosophy was on life or like what I thought was important? Yeah. What do you think was important? What did you like, what were your strongest belief systems? Like, so for me, like maybe like three or four years ago, it was like super, scientific i was like science is the ultimate pursuit like i was like almost like i didn't want to call myself i called myself like an agnostic but i kind of followed in like the atheist group where i'm like these religion like religions complete horseshit because like look at these islamic fundamentalism islamic fundamentalists and all the christians like look at how these christian fundamentalists they're freaking stupid like look Look at how stupid yeah. this is. And so it's like super rationally, scientifically oriented. That's like kind of where I was. So like, okay. what was your, like your perspective on like, I guess almost narrowing, narrowing it down to like, what did you think is the most truthful perspectives or like where, if you were going to like learn something new, where would you go? Would you go to like your religion? Would you go to your, like a science? Would you go to like, uh, philosopher would you go to yeah what did you value as the most authentic highest source of knowledge or maybe we can put it that way yeah I, I would say philosophy and logic was what I valued the most um, I think I still do to a certain degree I mean the philosophies have changed that I follow um, yeah, I really exactly. appreciated Buddhism, like secular Buddhism. Um, and a very elementary belief and a very uh, elementary understanding of how 
desire creates suffering. And if you were to let go of all desires, you would let go of suffering. And I think at that point in my life, I was sort of starting to drift towards nihilism and absurdism. Um, I think both of those beliefs, especially within the spiritual space and like even within Buddhism, I think both of those philosophies definitely have a place within Buddhism. Like this idea that life is suffering and suffering is inevitable. That is pre pretty nihilistic. And then there's a lot of like, like the Zen koans that's very like absurdist. Um, but yeah. 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 I would say well, that's what I was that. trying to get at is like, so maybe two years ago, you kind of fell more under like the nihilistic category than today. I was like, it was more like, how has your, how has it changed? Like what was different two years ago is kind of what I think I should have asked. It's like, so this process of growing up, the whole process is called growing up. So like the enlightenment, uh, this guy, Ken Wilber calls it waking up this process of going through these stages is like growing up. It's like how you develop in the whole process is that you make your subject into an object of the next subject. So however you're experiencing the world right now, that past self, that, that past perspective, that's an object, right? So it's like, this is, this is how I used to be in the third person. This is not how I am now. This is like something else entirely. This is not me. This is like an object. And that's like a natural process because over time yeah. we're, a we're able to like witness what our perspective is and see like, Oh, this perspective has limits. I need to get to something more encompassing, more holistic that has less limits. So it's like, for me, it was like, or say you get like a religious fundamentalist, they eventually, hopefully if they keep going through the growing up process, they see the limits in that belief system then they go to a more rational perspective. Maybe they're still a Christian, but they say, all right, maybe these like mythic uh, like interpretation, maybe these like more direct interpretations, maybe they're not as true as I once thought. I still am going to believe in God, but like the, the rational way to believe in God is like, this probably didn't happen. Uh, Moses didn't part the Red Seas. The earth wasn't created 6,000 years ago. These are just like stuff written in a book. And it's like, but I still believe in God. It's just like a different rational. So it's like the whole process is going through and seeing your past, making your past selves subjects into objects and like transcending them. The problem is, is we can't always do that. And sometimes there, we transcend into a higher level of understanding, but a previous subject is held on and we don't want to let go of it. We're not able to see that we're, that this is still a subject then we haven't made it into an object if that makes any sense whatsoever yeah um yeah i guess to sort of paraphrase it um would be to say like Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's like you're sort of acknowledging that your belief is a belief. Like it's not, um, like it's not, an entirely accurate worldview. Like it's just a segment of reality. It's just a piece or a color or like, a tiny little aspect of reality and you can like appreciate that like oh this is oh uh, no i don't know that is sort of complicated i do have a question about integral theory though uh and i don't know if you've gotten to this part or if it's answered in the book but is there a point to the game or the development like so it's sort of like what 
what is the motivation behind um, excelling, like developing? Like, why would one want to grow up or why would one want to wake up? So it's really tricky because when you learn the stage, it's obviously like if people see it as a game, they'll be like, I'm at the highest level. I'm at the highest rung. Like, get on my level. Like, you're, you're at this. It's easy to like – that's like the – absolute wrong way to approach it is like you're at this stage that's like under it's like because it's a hierarchy right so it's like yeah. it's here's a stage the next stage is this stage that whatever it's easy to make that into like i'm better than you because i'm at a higher stage of development the the point isn't to get in at a higher stage whatever your stage you're at is the perfect stage like it's as truthful as you can be at your certain certain stage of development it's more a way of the reason you develop is so that you have a more holistic more complete perspective so it's like you develop in order to have a more true understanding of the world around you like that's what you get from developing through these stages that doesn't mean that you have an incomplete view of reality it just means that your view of reality is as complete as it can be for whatever stage you're at so it's like so it's like it's not like this stage is false this stage is true it's like this stage is true this stage is more true this stage is more true and it's like it's just becoming more and more true as you go up but there's never like false versus true if that makes sense so like the integral theory yeah and no, i get what you're saying about how um it's it's just stages that, like it's just maybe describing a process instead of like prescribing like an ideal like you should be at the top of the thing it's just like no these people who do this they're at the top or they're they're at this stage of development um, i think one of the key insights is that we can use this model to solve like really practical problems in the world so it's like rather than the vast majority of people see their perspective as this is the only perspective i'm right like if you don't look at the world from my perspective, then you're wrong. Like this is how the vast majority of people operate. If you don't, if you're not a Christian, you're wrong. If you're not scientific, then this is, then you're going at truth the wrong way. If you're not doing like, if you're not supporting this movement that I'm a part of, then you're like, that's wrong of you to do that, to not support that. Like you're so racist and home. Like it's whatever it's saying that like, some people are at a certain stage of development where they can't see the world the same way as you see the world. So how do we cater to those people knowing that like they're not going to switch to your point of view? Like that's how they see the world because that's the most holistic, most complete view of the world that they can possibly see given their limits. And so it's more so like, understanding that this is how this like people at this stage view the world this way the people at this stage view the world this way this is where this kind of group comes from is kind of like a center of gravity around this stage it's like how can we let all of these stages work together and create a system where all the stages work together rather than thinking that everyone needs to be at this top stage you know yeah it sort of reminds me like a character guide or like, yeah, like a character guide like in like a video game or something. Like it shows you how to interact with certain things or even like animals. Like you, you have to know the qualities of a dog versus the qualities like of a coyote or a wolf. So you know how to interact with the animal in a way that you or that animal doesn't get hurt. Yeah. Um, so like, so the integral theory, it sounds like the goal is to create like a more, I mean, there's many different ways you can approach it. That's just one way to think about it. Another okay. way is like, if you understand the theory, it will help you move through the stages faster because you kind of know what to expect. It doesn't mean that you're not, you're going to jump like two stages. It just means that you kind of know what to expect on the path, where you're going to go, 
in what direction so you can kind of like make the subject into an object at a faster rate than you would if you had no clue where you're going and like what the 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 path is going to be going forward how your perspectives are going to change in yeah i don't know there's there's many different ways to approach it but yeah one way is like using it to create a more holistic society or more like systemic society where we we have better systems in place we we know how these different systems interact with each other and therefore we are able to create better solutions rather than thinking like for example like the drug crisis it's like the the solution that the government has come up for the drug crisis is very one one sided it's like we need to ban all drugs and criminalize it that only makes people want to do it more understanding the way that people act psychology this model understanding all these different things that play into it we can create a better solution because we know that just banning it outright is not going to solve anything if that makes sense yeah that's kind of yeah that's kind of mixing up integral theory and systems theory so it's not really like entirely just integral theory yeah um is there a cap like is is it a oh no you can develop infinitely yeah so it's like humans have only developed so far because like time constraints i guess but there is no like there's no like all right this is the final stage you have reached the final the pinnacle of the spiral dynamics model it's like no once you reach it there's always more room to grow like it's it's infinite okay and so ken wilbur talks about it if we want to go back full circle to where we started he talks about how enlightenment is only complete you 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 don't have a holistic enlightenment if you don't include growing up so if you have an enlight because you can there's stages of consciousness which is like your perspective on the world then there's states which is like do i am i experiencing it myself through a body through a soul through like in like a non-dual state of emptiness whatever whatever yeah. so like you can experience states of consciousness no matter what stage you're at a religious like fundam- what's that like if you take shrooms or some dmt yeah if you, you take can, like, psychedelics you can, yeah you can glimpse a higher state if you take a psychedelic you can no matter if you're speaking to is an like religious fundamentalist a scientist or like a Buddhist or like, or like a, someone that meditates a lot. Um, they can all experience enlightenment. It doesn't matter where you at, but you can't glimpse a higher stage. So you can be at like a certain stage. You can't glimpse what someone four stages above you is going to is viewing the world from it. Just, you just can't do it. So it's like, according to Ken Wilber, the only way to have the most holistic enlightenment as possible is to include both an enlightenment experience and integration, as well as a stage structure integration and experience. You have to reach the highest states of consciousness, but also as high of a stage of consciousness as you possibly can. It sounds like, it sounds like the, the development is based on like psychological frameworks or like like certain thought processes because it's sort of like and I, I think you would agree that me and any fundamentalist or any scientist or even the Buddha, we all experience the same raw sensations, you know? Like if I'm sitting in a chair and if the Buddha was sitting in the chair or the fundamentalist was sitting in the chair, we would all feel the same. We'd feel the same temperature, we'd still feel the same pressure. But it's just this like thinking that's going on in our head or this language or this like the the processes that we filter and interpret these experiences through so whereas like i might be like ah this chair is like squeaky or this is uncomfortable a fundamentalist i don't know what a fundamentalist would say about a chair 
there's a key distinction too. It's like, yes, like the, that's like definitely on the right track. I think you can go even further in saying like, the the purpose of this model is to understand how people experience reality so it's like yeah what is my experience right now and this model is telling me how my experience is going to change how it's going to grow how my perspectives are going to change so it's like I, no matter what stage you're at you're going to have the same experience of like sitting in a chair like you're going to have the same phenomenal experience as to be more specific like my my awareness is going to be the same what how do i explain it so it's like what i view as like what this how i view this experience is going to change but the experience itself isn't so it's like someone might view this table has made of matter the next the buddhist guy might not view this table as made of matter it's still going to be the same experience of something in front of you but how you view it changes did i just say yeah. the same? did i just say the same thing twice um how what you yeah I, i'm i'm just running in circles at this point wouldn't it wouldn't a psychological framework would it relate back to your emotions? Because it's sort of like, I'm sure a scientist who felt that the world was material, like their experiences would feel different. I mean, obviously there'd be a different psychological framework and like different thoughts that they'd have about things, but I'm sure they would feel differently than a Buddhist who saw the universe as like, um, is like connected or as one with him or is like everything that he saw, that's what he was. Um, yeah, 100%, 100%. I think that's what I was trying to elaborate on. It's like what the, ex- the actual phenomenal experience is the same, but how you feel about that experience can be wildly different, like night and day. So like how you actually yeah. view that, it sounds like it doesn't sound that crazy. Like, Oh, you're just going to view your experience differently. Like, Oh, that sounds cool. But that's actually like radical. It's like, I can view my experience in one way The But if I view it this other way, I'm going to have a completely different experience altogether. It, it's hard to use the, the same word like experience is like just being used interchangeably here but it's like yeah i'm gonna have the i'm still gonna feel a chair under my ass right now but yeah. how i view this everything around me in the actual sensations can be changed radically i think yeah no i no i it's sort of like if you hadn't eaten for 10 days and i just had a steak dinner and you put a piece of bread in front of me and you put a piece of bread in front of you, it's the same piece of bread, but we're going to feel like you said, night and day about it. I'm going to be like, Oh no, I'm full. I don't want this. You're going to be like, Oh fuck. Thank you so much. This is amazing. Yeah. Um, hundred percent. Yeah. And then you, you take that metaphor, that analogy even forward further. And it's like, some people see their everyday experience as mundane and useless and like, Oh, this is like a boring experience. How do I get out of this? How do I escape from this? Other people that have a different perspective, I would say a higher, more conscious perspective. They see everything around them with like, awe and like, here, like, Holy shit. Like what? Like I, this experience is wild right now. Like, what is happening? Yeah. Like, this is crazy. Like whatever I'm experiencing, that's like, it's the same. You're seeing the same things, but one person sees it as mundane. The other person sees it as like mystery. And like, it is like excited about the fact of I'm having this experience right now. Like, like I, I can get in my entire I think this is where, where I don't know, maybe this is wrong, but this is how I see like enlightenment. 
if you're not enlightened, you see everything as mundane, whatever. This is just the way things are. If you are enlightened, you see the same things, but you see them as like you can get fulfillment just in the process of life itself, in the process of experiencing, if that makes any sense. Like, yeah, when you reach a higher state of consciousness and understanding, you're like, damn, like I'm experiencing this right now. And that is your source of satisfaction. It's like life itself and whatever I'm experiencing, that is my source of fulfillment rather than yeah. – rather than I need some external distraction to fulfill me because this right now is mundane and like, I don't like this experience, you know? Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I agree with that. I think that that's a big, like the utility I imagine behind meditation, at least as a tool for enlightenment, I mean, I'm sure it has other uses, but I, I, I definitely see that as one use of meditation and this sort of goes back to David, Hume, uh, David Hume's bundle theory, where it pretty much states that human experience is just this like loosely tied bundle of a bunch of different factors. And the example, like of what I was saying earlier, is like, it's just like temperature, pressure, words in your head, like some light, some sound, some taste, but it is really crazy once you get like once you really start contemplating things because everything is just it's so simple but it's so amazing at the same time so it's like even a very extremely emotionally charged event like say if i'm on a roller coaster i have all the same basic framework as that i have sitting right here right now it's some colors some pressure, some like um, coolness or heat coming off of the roller coaster. Like it's the same basic underlying principles and you can appreciate them at like at any given moment. Like, yeah, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like the sensations don't change, but... But how, yeah, you're experiencing the same sensations, the same heat, the same color. It's just like, yeah, you have everything you need right in front of you. So it's like, why would you need to go chase some drugs or some alcohol or some roller coaster, some adrenaline when you can just sit on your meditation cushion and I think that's where people don't understand. I think that's like the point of meditation. It's like the common, why wouldn't someone meditate? Because they don't see it as valuable. Why wouldn't they see it as valuable? Because you're just sitting, you're not doing something in the world. You're just sitting down and you're just closing your eyes and it seems like you're not being productive. But in reality, you're doing a lot because you're changing your experience and you're changing how you see the world. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's sort of like quality over quantity. It, it's like you uh, going on a roller coaster going on a roller coaster is a very stimulating event and even just like everything that surrounds it there's a lot of people, there's a lot of colors, there's a lot of this, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of things to pay attention to so it's really stimulating. And then meditation it's sort of the opposite there's so little that it's incredibly stimulating because it's sort of like you're at the roller coaster, you're bombarded with so much information and in meditation, you're looking at information so closely that it's almost bombarding you in the same intensity. It's just like coming in through a different filter. It's sort of like, yeah, like zooming out and seeing everything or zooming in and then seeing how complex it is. Definitely. And the reason that, most people don't stick with meditation is because if you're used to the, a bunch of stimuli and a bu everything bombarding your senses, when you take all that away, it's not pleasurable. It's like, all right, like now I, it's almost like you have to go through the, like the refract refractory period, whatever you call it. It's like you have to go through the low before you get back to the normal of like, this is super like, 
small details that are like super interesting. Like you, it takes a little bit to get to that point. So the first, like quite a bit of time when you meditate, it's like, this is boring. Like, what's the point of this? Whatever. The more you meditate, the more you're able to tap into the, the same sensation of having an adrenaline on a roller coaster. You're able to tap into like that, the interesting, like the different sensations within the subtle aspects of life or experience. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, really interesting how infinite and like just like infinitely complex it is because it's like the more you zoom out the more complex it gets like say for us to like you zoom to me then you zoom to my family that's a more complex family unit you can zoom out to a city that's a more complex you zoom out to this or whatever but even if you zoom in it gets infinitely more complex you zoom into my brain there's a bunch of different organisms in me it's just like both you can yeah, both ways. It's just infinitely complex. Whether you're zooming out and you're getting a bunch of stimulation or you're zooming in and you're getting very little stimulation, but it's just as much stimulation yeah, because yeah. it's just so complex. It reminds me of, uh, you ever seen those like fractal videos? It's like, this is what you experience on DMT. And it's just like an infinite fractal going in and then going back out and then just like in forever. Yeah. yeah it's like that's what your experience is right now it's like that that's another interesting idea too it's like all right you can go really into the subtle what happens when you really get super present is you realize that that time what you perceive as time is just like your thoughts creating like this is the future this is the past if you go really into that like subtle state and you go really into like minutia you get into the state of the the calm state of like this is all there is right here like there is no future or past and like that's hard to you can't understand that with the mind like oh yeah tech yeah there's no future or past like there's you can only like experience life in the present but when you yeah. actually experience that, that is when everything changes. I don't know. It's like that's when you experience one, – one cool distinction, too, is the word eternity. What does eternity mean to you? Yeah, see, that's what I'm really confused about. And this is what I, I've had some, like, quarrels in my mind about eternity um, – what I understand it as is it's encompassing everything and like every possibility and every, it's just everything. Like eternity just is, it feels like, like it's just all yeah. encompassing. So like the common idea is that like eternity is infinitely into the past, infinitely into the future. Like that's eternity yeah but you can only ever experience anything in the right in right now in this like yeah. point so it's like eternity really is just that point that is eternity yeah. and so when people i think this is something that's been like it's always been on my mind in buddhism so you say like you have an ego death is you realize that you live forever like you you can't die and for most people that sounds insane but when you really get into it it's like because who you really are is not the body obviously the body's gonna pass away but if you identify if you figure out who you really are and that's what you identify with is you like you, what's that deeper awareness that never dies that never changes that is like eternity that is like the timeless now that is what never changes like if you i don't know i don't know where i was going with that no yeah i get what you're saying um I, the, 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 that at least 
for me sort of um, reminds me of like a common way people describe meditation. And I've never gotten this. I mean, maybe it works for some people, but it's sort of like you see your mind as the sky and then your thoughts as the clouds that sort of come through. And that's, I think, what awareness is. And if I'm understanding, understanding you correctly, is it sort of like the body itself is just like a cloud in the mind of awareness. Like ego is just a cloud in the mind of awareness. Everything is just a cloud in the mind of awareness because that's the only thing that, like, like something could only exist if there's something to perceive it. So the only way that eternity or nothing or anything can exist is if there's some awareness, is if awareness exists. Because if there's no awareness, then nothing exists because there's nothing to perceive it. Definitely. I think if there's anything I've learned, it's the good luck trying to understand this enlightenment stuff. <laughs> because it's so paradoxical and you literally can't understand it unless you like it. I think what I've learned is that the way that we that we currently think of understanding, you won't be able to understand enlightenment that way. Like we, in our, in our culture, knowledge is put on like the highest pedestal, like facts, data, evidence, that's like put on the highest pedestal. If you try to approach enlightenment from that standpoint, good fucking luck. It's more, it's like yeah. you have to completely reshape how you view acquiring acquiring information and like if you want to understand what enlightenment is you have to be so open to any possibility of how you're going to get to it not like yeah. it's gonna, like i'm gonna develop the it's so easy to develop consciousness work and enlightenment into a belief system yeah like i like i believe this is what my in group tells me what enlightenment is this is I have the best way to reach enlightenment. If you don't follow my way, then you won't reach it. Like that's what happens in a lot of organizations or like a lot of uh, yeah. different religious organizations. So one I'm thinking of in particular is like Kriya Yoga. I got into Kriya Yoga for a while. It's a great practice. There's a lot of dogma in it. So it's hard to like extract it from like the organizations. A lot of these organizations so you get like initiated into it. And then you move up different stages within these organizations. Like you go from like stage one Korea practice, stage two, or I can't remember exactly what it's called, like level two. And like, then they're like, oh, once you, it's very kind of like tricky. Like it's like what I see it as, it's like my organization has the correct belief system. If you follow these stages, you will become enlightened. If you don't, yeah then maybe you will, but it won't be as effective as mine, my own path. So it's like, yeah. don't make enlightenment into a belief system. Yeah, I think, especially at least how I understand enlightenment is it really does seem like anybody can become enlightened. Like a kid can become enlightened, a drug addict can become enlightened, a truck driver can become enlightened. Because Just because by the it, nature of enlightenment. Yeah, because it's a part of experience itself. It's not like some group has the correct belief system. It's like it's so intertwined with your experience of reality that it doesn't matter who you are, you can have the experience. Yeah, and I think this this just popped into my head, and I just I wanted to share. I think you would appreciate it. Um, so it's sort of like how you were talking about boredom and like boredom with an experience. I think an interesting question, like in regards to boredom, would just to be would be to ask, like, how do you know? So if someone was like, I'm bored, it's like, how do, how do you know that you're bored? Like, like, what is boredom? How do you how do you know? And then it's comp it's like, you know, how do I know that I'm bored? You know, like, what is boredom? And then that automatically puts you in like a meditative state, you know, of like, really trying to see like, huh, like what like how do i know that i'm bored what is boredom why am is, i saying i'm bored yeah what is boredom yeah so just 
what is boredom? Is it just not being happy with my experience? Is it wanting to be somewhere else? Like I'm bored because I don't like this experience and like I want something more exciting. It's like, why, why don't you like this experience? I don't know. I just don't like it. Uh, well, like what's your, what's your thoughts about it? Oh, because I think it's bad. Well, get rid of that. Are you still bored? It's like, it, you can just keep asking questions like that. Yeah. I, yeah, I think it'd be interesting to ask, like, how do you know? Like, to keep asking, how do you know? So it's like, I'm bored. It's like, how do you know? It's like, well, I want to do that thing. It's like, well, how do you know that you want to do that thing? Um, yeah, and then that sort of, like, really starts to get into, like, your psychological processes. Oh, just fuck with me too much. <laughs> <laughs> So like, I don't freak. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I give up. I give up. <laughs> I'm not bored, man. I'm not bored. Can't tell you nothing. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's a good place to kind of wrap it up. Thanks for uh, joining me on the podcast. Um, let's see, is there anywhere they can? F- the audience can reach you or like, do you have any words of wisdom to end it off? Or uh, I don't know how to end this. Um, yeah. I mean, I have a medium account <laughs> where I write vlogs. You can find that if you just type, uh, Jaime J A I M E A Lopez at, and just type medium. Um, as far as words of uh, words of wisdom go, whenever you're feeling something, just ask yourself, how do you know? <laughs> if you're sad, how do you know? If you're happy, how do you know? There we go. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. All right, man. Yeah.